Good morning, good day, good evening, good night, whenever you happen to be joining us. Welcome once again to Just Thoughts. Against the Redeemer, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Since the very beginning, even since the original sin in the garden, mankind has either been deceived into or originated their own ideas which are against God or against His Word. From the people who were on earth who gave and took in marriage to the Nephilim and bore giants, to Nimrod who thought he could build his own way to salvation, to the idol worshippers of the land of Canaan and many other areas, even to today, quite frankly, to the Kenites, saturating themselves into the tribes of Israel and twisting the truth right up into the modern day, where mankind finds new ways to attempt to explain humankind and human behavior, or our origins. But even so, it matters not. Since mankind first said in his own mind, I have a better way, which does not include God or His Word. There have been those who have rebelled against God, again against their Redeemer. Out of the minds of flesh men came all of these ideas. Out of the minds of mankind came the ideas that aliens bestowed life on this planet, that evolution is how man came to be in his so-called modern form or that global warming will destroy us all, or any of a ton or an innumerable amount of false narratives which are commonplace nowadays in the world. They're all against God, which is to say, our Redeemer, whether it's the Godhead, or Christ, or the Holy Spirit, any of the offices of God. And it is rebellion or highbrow conceit of human beings. Before we get into the biblical study tonight, I want to take just a few minutes to talk about what's going on in the world. Some of the things I've seen going on recently, of course we always have Antifa. You know, it, it, it astonishes me that we've got people in China that are protesting against communism and throwing rocks at tanks and troops. And in our own country, we've got Antifa busting windows, throwing rocks, beating people, protesting against the capitalist system which has given them all the freedoms that they have, including freedom of speech. And they do this because they want socialism. In other words, they want something for nothing. And then, if you look at the entertainment world, Showtime, Netflix, HBO, Disney, Hulu, and many of the broadcast networks on television. Basically all the big entertainment outlets are now promoting perversion in virtually every new show or series that they are producing. The more you see of these on these channels, the more you will see that gay and lesbian and transgender lifestyles are taking center stage above everything else. Only a few years ago, virtually every show began having token gay and lesbian characters or situations. And now they all do it. In other words, all the networks do it. And it is becoming the norm for these movie and TV venues. 
to not only promote these lifestyles, but to shove them in your face. More and more commercials even are highlighting whimsically gay characters or lesbian characters or pushing this perversion. And one wonders what's next. I have no doubt in my mind that eventually, either sooner or later, even worse things will rear their heads on television as entertainment, such as pedophilia, maybe even bestiality. And they too will become cornerstones of so-called modern entertainment. It's bad enough that the networks rewrite history to favor their false narratives and change the way of things to include lies or their own fantasies about the way the world has been or how they would like to have history be written. But what they're doing now by normalizing abnormality and promoting it as normal and at the same time criticizing normal as outdated and stale ideas takes its place with all the rest of what is written in our Father's Word as people try to portray that God and His Word should have no place amongst us. We have communists and socialists and perverts and the godless portrayed on television as heroes, while actual heroes for the most part are ignored or painted in a negative or twisted light. Another false narrative. Yet, people, that is to say the populace, by the droves are paying for these channels and subscribing all the more. In other words, rather than standing for God and say, I will not watch this crap, people are shelling out dollars hand over fist and making these companies rich to pump out this perversion. Because, after all, people must not be deprived of being entertained. Even if the entertainment is brainwashing them and their unsuspecting children or young minds who have not had the benefit of learning or knowing the truth. It is very much like Rome of old where people cheered as blood was shed in the Colosseums and in the auditoriums. The masses of the world are turning away from God who created them and adopting the perverse wiles of the flesh. Kids today have no idea who Christ is, but they know Muhammad. They have no idea how America was formed. They have no idea about world history other than things like slavery. Every negative thing is learned, but every positive thing is shunned. They have no idea what communism was and how hated it was in the world, along with socialism, and what these things have done to the world or the amount of blood that they have shed. But they know how to protest against their own country and call for socialism to be the system of government they want over them, largely, again, because they think it means a freebie for them, or in some twisted way, they think it adds up to equality. When the truth is, it means anything but. There is nothing new under the sun, as the preacher Solomon told us. And as we will soon hear from Scripture, man has long rebelled against God and the truth, as did Lucifer when he fell in rebellion and rose up against God. The Bible is full of types and examples of these things, so much so until it is hard to choose only a few chapters to teach these things from. Nevertheless, we will choose a couple and go with it. Be turning, if you will, to the book of Numbers, chapter 16. That is where we will begin this evening. Now let's set this up for you for what is going on. 
God had chosen a Redeemer. His Redeemer. In other words, His chosen Redeemer. Moses. And this Redeemer, Moses, through the power of God, had led the children of Israel out of oppression and the bondage of Egypt. But as we will soon see, man is a fickle creature who forgets very quickly that God chooses who he wants to lead or redeem. Moses was an Old Testament type of Jesus Christ. Not only did he write of Christ, but he himself was a type of deliverer. He was also called the lawgiver. But he, in fact, was a type of Christ, a type of deliverer that delivered the people from bondage and gave them the word of God. There are many types of Christ in the Old Testament. And by the reverse, there are also many types of Satan or those who put their fleshly wants before the word of God and the wisdom of God to disobey him or to completely ignore him. And we shall see what the fate of these who rebel against the Redeemer shall be as we read these scriptures. Let these things be a lesson to you because all these things are types and examples. Let us begin in Numbers chapter 16. But before we begin this, as you should always do before you study our Father's Word, let us go before our Father in prayer and ask for wisdom and guidance as we study this His Most Holy Word. So let us pray and let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, glory to Thy most holy name, O Heavenly Father. We come before you this day, Father, to ask for wisdom and guidance and understanding of these, your most holy scriptures. We ask you, Father, to open eyes and ears and hearts and minds to be able to receive these truths. We ask you for a blessing, Father, to give this mouth the ability to speak clearly and concisely those things which you would have to be heard. And we ask these things, Father, nothing wavering, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, who in English was called Jesus Christ, yet we know his true name was Yahushua, and he was Hamashiach, that is to say, the Messiah. Amen. And amen. So, <clears throat> Numbers chapter 16, and verse 1. This will be concerning Korah, who was one of the Kohathites, who was unhappy with what God had sent him to do, or given him the task to do. So, Numbers chapter 16 and verse 1, and it reads, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and Om, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. Okay, naturally there are some um, generations skipped here because Israel was in the bondage to Egypt for about 400 or so, 430 years or so. So it is not possible for Korah to be the uh, great-grandson of Levi. However, in Hebrew, there is no word for grandfather or great-grandfather or so on and so forth. It's simply pointing out that Korah was a bona fide Levite. And Dathan and Abiram were sons of Reuben. In other words, they were of the, the tribe of Reuben. Verse 2. And they rose up before Moses. In other words, this is to say a rising up in rebellion. With certain of the children of Israel... 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, in other words, famed people, not unlike today's famous so-called super preachers or even famed government officials, who are as corrupt as ever these men were. Verse 3. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, 
you, te you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy. Every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then, lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Now this is a classic line, which is still used to this very day, by the wicked, to label the righteous as evil, and to twist the truth in doing so, and to drag down as many possible as will believe them, with them, into the darkness of deception. In other words, what have they said here? You've taken too much upon you, Moses. All the congregation is holy, not just you. Okay, well, in a manner of speaking, Israel is holy, because they are God's chosen people. However, God chose for them a redeemer and a leader. And that's not subject to change because Korah or Abiram or any of these other people don't like it. So what did they charge Moses with then? They say, you lift yourselves up above the congregation of the Lord. In other words, are you trying to make yourself better than the rest of us? Verse 4. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. In other words, in sorrow and anger. Verse 5. And he spake unto Korah. You know, Korah was his kinsman, a fellow Levite, and, and many people believe that Korah was actually Moses' cousin. And he spake unto Korah and to all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his, and who is holy, and will cause him, that is to say God's chosen, to come near unto him. Even him to whom he hath chosen will he come near unto him. In other words, God will come near to his chosen people. Verse 6. This do, okay, Moses has given him a, 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 a task here. This do, take you censors, Korah, and all his company. Verse 7. And put fire therein, and put incense in them, before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. In other words, what Moses is saying here is, you do not know your place. God has given you a task to fulfill as far as in the tribe movements and what the Levites were supposed to do, at least this branch of them, the Kohathites. But they're not content with that. They're not happy with that. Verse 8. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi. Verse 9. In other words, he's trying to reason with them here. Seemeth it a small thing unto you that the God, that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? In other words, is that a small thing to you that God has chosen you to do that and you want more? In other words, as I said, Korah and the sons of Levi that joined him were not content to serve God as God had given them service to do. Rather, they wanted to be the heads of Israel. They wanted to be the head of the congregation. Korah here is a type and example, if you will, of a man who is not unlike Lucifer turning into Satan via Korah's rebellion against the will of God. Just as Satan once did before this earth age. Verse 10. And he hath brought thee near unto him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And ye seek the priesthood also? In other words, it's not good, of you, good enough that you're already involved in the taking care of the tabernacle and ministering to the people. The tabernacle, I should say, not tabernacle. The old mouth not wanting to work as usual. Anyway, in other words, they wanted more. They wanted the priesthood. For which, verse 11, For which cause both thou and thy company are gathered together against the Lord? And what is there in that you murmur against him? Now, one thing we should realize here is that the Levites 
are the proper tribe, at least in this time, for the priest line. However, the Kohathites, of which Korah was a member, wanted more than God had allotted them. They wanted the power of the priesthood. If you look to the future of what will happen in the New Testament, and actually through parts of the Old Testament, these people are very eerily similar to what would happen when the Kenites would eventually enter into the tribes of Israel and in like manner deny their Redeemer, that is to say Christ, and deny Him to the point that they accused Him and caused His death so that they could keep the priesthood for themselves. In other words, it was a money-making racket to them. It is a deception which still to this very day plagues the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Now, the Kenites call themselves Jews when in fact they are the synagogue or the temple of Satan. And they have minced themselves into the tribe of Judah, which is made up of the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, and the handful of Levites within them. But this same doctrine of the Kenites extends even into many churches and denominations of Christianity as it is this day. Verse 12 And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. In other words, Moses sent for them and they refused to come up. Verse 13 and these will be the words of uh, Abiram and Eliab. Verse 13. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except that thou make thyself altogether a prince over us? In other words, what have we got here? We've got the same thing that Satan had against God. We've got jealousy. We've got the same thing the Kenites will have against Christ. We've got jealousy. In other words, they're mocking Moses in what he said to Korah. In other words, they even begin it the same way. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that floweth with milk and honey? In other words, we had plenty in Egypt. Yeah, except for the fact you were slaves and you were made to worship the Egyptian gods. To kill us in the wilderness? In other words, you've drug us out here in the wilderness to kill us, Moses. Except, or for the purpose that thou makest thyself altogether a prince over us. Now, did Moses make himself a prince over these people? No. He had been a prince in Egypt. But did he make himself a prince over the children of Israel? No, God did. However, these people, in their own stupid fleshly logic seemed to think that Moses and not God was in control despite all they had seen and all they had witnessed since before they had departed Egypt and they knew that God spoke with Moses and they knew the things that Moses said would happen came to pass you see this is what happens all too often it doesn't matter what people see it doesn't matter how much you show them even from God's Word, or how much you break it down from the languages, or how much you show them the manners of speech, they still will not believe. They cling on to their doctrines as though it were a rock in the middle of a river. Verse 14. And this will be uh, Abiram and uh, Eliab continuing to speak, most likely Abiram, or maybe even Dathan. Verse 14. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into the land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us the inheritance of the fields and vineyards. In other words, all those things that were promised to us. Will thou put out the eyes of these men? Question? We will not come up. Now, what does this last portion of it mean? Will thou put out the eyes of these men? In other words, are you trying to blind these people with deception and lifting yourself up as a prince of the people? We will not come up. In other words, we're not going to come up there and visit you. Obviously, they sent a messenger back and forth here. Verse 15. And Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. 
I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. In other words, I haven't done anything to them for them to treat me this way. Verse 16, And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they, and Aaron tomorrow. In other words, all these people that are rebelling against me and my brother Aaron, be before the Lord tomorrow. Verse 17, And take every man his censer, and put incense in them, and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer. Two hundred and fifty censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. Verse 18. And they took every man his censer, and put fire in them, and laid incense thereon. In other words, as a sweet savor unto the, uh, unto the nostrils of God. And stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. Verse 19. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. Now I want you to have a look at what's coming up here. I want you to see a spiritual example of what is in store for those who rebel against God and teach false doctrines when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ does finally appear, that is to say, after the Antichrist's reign. Verse 20, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Verse 21, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. In other words, God has had enough. Verse 22, And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and will thou be wroth with all the congregation? In other words, Moses believing here that God was going to destroy the entire congregation of Israel. There is another case where God thought to destroy the tribes of Israel because of their rebellion. And Moses reasoned with God. Not that God needed reasoning with. But God does get angry. You know, there, people say God never hates. Or Christ never hates. But there are things that God hates. And they are written of in this very word for those who care to read them. Moses here is pleading for his people. Verse 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 24, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Verse 25. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. Verse 26. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. In other words, do not touch anything, and you could even take this to a deeper level, don't listen to them. Don't touch anything. You remember Eve was told not to touch the tree of the knowledge and evil? Or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, these people are being told, do not touch anything that is theirs, lest you be concerned in all their sins. Verse 27. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side, and Dathan and Abiram came out, and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. Verse 28. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not them done them of my own hand. Do you remember what Christ said to the scribes and Pharisees? You should. Because it's very similar to what Moses just said. Christ said, I came not of myself. If I come of myself, it is nothing but the Father who sent me. In other words, Christ came to do the will of God. And again, Moses is a type of Christ. Verse 29. If these men, this is Moses continuing to speak, 
If these men, and he's talking about Korah, Abiram, Dathan, if these men die the common death of all men, in other words, if they die of old age, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. In other words, if they die of some natural cause, whether it be a heart attack or, or, or whatever, if they die of some natural cause, then the Lord hath not sent me. Verse 30. But if the Lord make a new thing, in other words, if the Lord does something else, if these men do not die naturally, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up, and all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And in case you haven't noticed here, the pit is a big hint here. Remember where Satan shall be cast during the day of the Lord. Verse 31. And it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was underneath them. Verse 32. Verse 32. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. Verse 33. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. Okay, cast alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from amongst the congregation. You've got even a type here of what will happen at the final judgment, when souls are cast alive into the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment. And they will perish from amongst the congregation, which is to say, from amongst the children of God. They will disappear completely. The death of the soul. Verse 34. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them. For they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. In other words, it terrified them. As it should have. This is part of the fear of the Lord that you should have. Because God can do this. However, God wants your love and He wants your reverence, which can also be translated as fear. Verse 35. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 uh, men that offered incense. Why? Because they had aligned themselves with Korah, Abiram, and uh, Dathan. Verse 36. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Verse 37. Speak unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning, and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. In other words, what's hallowed? The censers. The censers are hallowed. In other words, they're holy. But the fire in them, which these men placed in them, is the same as Nadab and Abihu tried to place on the altar of God. It is a false fire. It is an unholy fire. Why is it an unholy fire? Because these men were burning incense unto the Lord, but rebelling against the Lord. In other words, they were dual-minded. They claimed to be in service of the Lord, but they're rebelling against the Lord. The way that many preachers, pastors, and super preachers do to this very day as they spread their false doctrines, such as the rapture. And do not teach the truth. And they do it largely for gain's sake. Or for notoriety. But God wants them, God wants Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, that he wants him specifically. Why? Because he is a Levite, and only he is allowed to touch the censers to take them up and to dump the fire out of them. In other words, dump that filthy false fire out. But the censers are hollowed. Verse 38. These censers, or excuse me, the censers of these sinners against their own souls, let them make broad plates for the covering of the altar, for they offered them before the Lord, therefore they are hollowed. And they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. In other words, 
in times past, the children of Israel, even Kohath and his sons, had offered with these censers amongst, uh, before the Lord. So they were holy. And they had, in before time, held holy fire and incense which were pleasing unto God at that time. However, these men have just put fake fire on God's altar, so to speak. They have put fake fire into the censer. That's why Eleazar has been told to dump that fire out and to carry these censers in and to make broad plates for the covering of the altar. Verse 39. And Eleazar the priest took the brassen censers wherewith they that were burnt had offered. In other words, those that had been uh, burned alive, the 250. And they were made broad plates for the covering of the altar. In other words, all of these Kohathites and all of these children of Israel, of, of the tribe of Levi, that had been given this duty to bring these censers forth and to burn sweet incense unto the Lord, it was not the censers that were bad. It was the false doctrine and the rebelling against God that was bad. So Eleazar will now take these holy items and make them for a covering for the altar. Verse 40. To be a memorial unto the children of Israel that no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron come near to offer incense before the Lord. That he be not as Korah and his company, as the Lord had said unto him by the hand of Moses. In other words, from now on, it would be the line of Aaron of the tribe of Levi who would be the priest line. Why? Because the rest of them could not be trusted. Verse 41. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. You know, it amazes me sometimes how stupid human beings can be. Well, I should say, it should amaze me how stupid human beings can be, but I live in the modern world where I see it every day. But as one reads this, obviously Moses did not kill these people. Okay? God Almighty, omnipotent, by His hand and consuming fire, killed these people. Yet the children of Israel are blaming Moses. In other words, kill the messenger. It's the messenger's fault. Verse 42. And it came to pass when the congregation were gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Verse 43. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 44. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. In other words, every time something like this happens, you will see the compassion in Aaron and Moses to fall upon their faces and plead before the Lord. Verse 46. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord, and the plague is begun. Verse 47. And Aaron took, as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the congregation, and behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. Verse 48. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now what do we have a type of here? We have a type of Christ even in Aaron. Standing between the dead and the living. And stopping the plague. By what? By making atonement. As Christ made atonement for us when he was crucified on the cross and took on our sins upon him, that is to say, those of us who believe. Verse 49. 
Now they that died in the plague were 14,700 besides them that died about the matter of Korah. In other words, the 250 and the whole family of Korah, Abiram, and um, the other one, <laughs> whatever his name was, Dathan. Verse 50. And Aaron returned unto Moses, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the plague was stayed. You see, God will not tolerate disobedience. God will not tolerate rebellion. He will not even tolerate murmuring from those His hand has liberated. It is an example of us of how to conduct ourselves or how not to conduct ourselves. Those that have not been liberated, that is to say, those who know not the truth, are ignorance. And God does not simply punish ignorance. But once one has come to the truth, in other words, these men that were destroyed knew the truth, at least at some point. They had seen the hand of God at work. They had offered offerings to God. No doubt they had sacrificed to God. And yet, they wanted more. They were not content in their jobs. Let us look at another example of men who thought to overthrow the children of Israel or shall think to overthrow the children of Israel. What we're going to cover here is Ezekiel 38. As you know, these chapters, Ezekiel 38 and 39, speak of a future time of the battle of Haman Gog. This is, of course, prophetical even from our time forward because, again, it does speak of the battle of Haman Gog, which is yet to take place. The battle of Haman Gog, quite frankly, takes place only moments before the return of Christ. However, there is a, is a deeper and larger message here, if you can grasp it. So, Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, in other words, came to Ezekiel, Verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Mesek, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Okay, as you probably know, those of you who are Shepherd's Chapel students, we are talking here about the land of Gog and Magog, and the chief prince of Meshech, which is to say Rosh. Rosh is a word that would later become Rus, which, quite frankly, means uh, prince or chief prince, and can also mean red in certain usages, that is to say rosh, rus, rush. It's where the word rouge comes from. But it's talking about that red system. Is it speaking of Russia? Well, in, in, in the bigger sense, yes it is, but it's not necessarily talking about uh, all of Russia. It's talking about the red system of Russia, which at this point where we are in history seems to have failed, but it is still very much alive and boiling underneath what we see with our eyes in Russia today. So, what is, what is, uh, what is Ezekiel being told here? Son of man, in other words, flesh man that I have chosen, Set thy face against Gog in the land of Magog. In other words, this is where the Amalekites and the Edomites would eventually move to. And eventually they would move up into what is, again, modern day Russia. The chief prince of Meshech, which is to say Rosh, Rus, which would become the Rus, and finally the Russias, or Russia. And Tubal, and prophesy against him. Verse 3. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the old Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Verse 4. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses, and horsemen, all of them clothed in all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now, what did Esau by God get told that he would do all the way through his life, that he would live by the sword. Verse 5. Persia, 
Ethiopia and Libya with them. Okay, with who? With old Edom, with Russia. All of them with shield and helmet. Now, what's funny about Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya? Well, you all know where Persia is. That's modern-day Iran. Ethiopia now stands for uh, parts of Africa, or, or even the entire continent nowadays, as it, as it could be spoken. And Libya, which is in the northern half of the continent of Africa. But what do all of these uh, places have in common? Well, they are in fact all Islamic country states. Most of them totalitarian. Verse 6. Gomer and his bands, and the house of Togomora in the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. In other words, we're talking about all the communist nations of the world, uh, or what will be again communist nations. In other words, still feeding off of that old red system. China still living under it. Uh, many countries around the world still living under that system. And, and people in this country wanting to bring it here. You know, Bernie Sanders and uh, Nancy Pelosi and uh, Orcasio Ortiz, whatever her first name is which has proven herself to be one of the most colossal morons that has ever lived on this planet. Her and, of course, Joe Biden. But uh, basically what you're talking about here are leftists. Leftists. It is leftist ideology that brings forth socialism and communism. It is leftist ideology that does away with God and the rights of men and puts heavy burdens on them. Taxation and gives away freebies and kisses the hind ends of minorities, that is to say the ethnos, to get them to vote for them to bring them to power. And why do they do that? Because their policies are so unpopular till no one would support them except their own kind, their own cronies, and people who will do it in order to gain a freebie. Verse 7. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself thou, and all the company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter days, in other words, in, in the last days, in this generation of victory. Thou shalt come into the land which is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Now, what are we talking about here? What is the land that was brought back from the sword? What is the land that was bought for a burial place for Gog and Magog? Well, we're speaking here prophetically of the children of Israel which migrated to this country and formed a state called Alaska which is our most western and northern state, save of Hawaii, which is would be considered uh, western southern. But we're speaking prophetically of Alaska, which was purchased from old Esau, that is to say Edom, Russia, by the United States on October 18th of 1867. And it was a wasteland when we bought it. That's why Russia didn't want it. And look at all the oil and gold and things that have been brought forth out of Alaska. In other words, it's been a treasure trove. And Esau has wanted it back ever since. Even now they fly jets over our coasts and have flown over Alaska invading our territory. Are they getting ready for something? You betcha they are. But what shall Gog, Esau, that is to say all the red countries and the enemy do? In other words, the enemies of America. What are they going to do? Verse 9. Thou shalt ascend and come down like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. In other words, they are going to come at us from the north. 
from a land which Israel, which is to say America, that is to say we are the offspring, us and Europe are the offspring of the Israelites. And all who believe upon the name of Christ are adopted into that, no matter what country they come from. If they believe on the name of Christ, they become Israel. They become the prince that prevails with God, the prince that has power with God. On a spiritual level, are they bloodline? No, they're not bloodline, but they are grafted in. Now, you know this verse that we just covered, these set of verses, speak of an actual event which shall come to pass, but look deeper. Socialism and communism are already coming into this land of the free, like a cloud, fogging up our nation with those who support this totalitarian system and those who holler collusion with Russia when in fact they who holler collusion are themselves in fact leftists, socialists, and communists who lie and trade votes for entitlements and would sell themselves out to this system in a moment if they thought it benefited them. In other words, they would go the way of Cain or the way of old Esau. As Esau took a bowl of uh, lentil soup for his birthright, these people sell away their Christianity, even though they claim to be Christians. Bernie Sanders is Jewish. I don't know what he claims to be, but Nancy Pelosi claims to be a Catholic. All of these people go to church and show themselves that, oh, they're just freedom fighters and liberators standing up for the rights of America, when in fact, they are nothing more than socialists and morons. While this verse that we read references an actual event in which Russia and the red system of Russia shall come against the United States for conquest, it is not hard to see today how many in our own country, from high school to colleges, right on up into government, would gladly sell out our own country to this totalitarian system if it meant gain for them. Verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass at the same time shall things come to my mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. In other words, all this is done in evil. It's all done in an evil thought. In other words, who is God addressing here? Who, who, who is addressing? God is speaking. And who is God speaking to? Well, he's telling Ezekiel what to say, but he's telling Ezekiel what to say to Gog and Magog and Gomer and uh, Togamora. In other words, and, and Libya and Persia and, and all the things mentioned. All these countries that basically hate America and show that they hate America, though they say, we are the religion of peace or we are your friends. Just as those in our government say, we represent you. We represent the working class. We represent the poor. We represent people of color. We represent the disenfranchised gay and lesbian and transgender. When really what they represent is themselves and they use these as pawns. And in so doing, they forward perversion. And they bring forth want in the world. Want for what? Well, want for money, want for wealth, want for riches, want for power, but moreover, want for simple truth. And the people don't even realize what they are. Which is why they keep getting voted into office election cycle after election cycle after election cycle. Verse 11. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest. Them that dwell safely. All of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. In other words, that, that's a clear indicator of America. I know that there's some people going to say, well, America's 
being walled up to keep Mexicans from entering into it. Yeah, maybe so, but that's the entire nation. This says unwalled villages. In other words, you don't have any towns in America that are completely walled up. Now, while you may have housing developments and uh, people that wall up their own yards, our country is a wallless country with neither bars nor gates other than what has been aforementioned. Verse 12 to continue. To take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn mine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, plural. In other words, a melting pot of people gathered out of all the nations of the world which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. In other words, we're talking about the United States of America in a prophetical speech here. Verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarsus. In other words, who are we talking about here? The Kenites and other Gentiles. With all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? To carry away silver and gold? And to take away the cattle and goods? To take a great spoil? In other words, remember what Edom did whenever the tribes, or, or that is to say, uh, whenever the Babylonian captivity came along. Oh, they went rushing into Jerusalem to get everything they could. That is to say what Nebuchadnezzar and his hordes had left. There's nothing new under the sun, friends. Verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto God, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people Israel dwelleth safely, Shall thou not know it? In other words, you're going to know it. Why do they dwell safely? Because we have the blessings of God, even though our country is turning away from God at an alarming rate. Verse 15. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the northern out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, and a great company and a mighty army. Now, naturally, they're probably will be some horses, but, you know, they're going to have to cross about a 55-mile uh, ocean way to get to America, that is to say, to get to Alaska. And they are coming with a great army, a mighty army. In other words, there will be tanks. It doesn't matter what they bring, helicopters, jets, tanks. It doesn't matter. God will put an end to it, like instantly. Verse 16. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. In other words, in the last days, in the very last days, quite frankly. And I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me. When I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Now, how is God going to sanctify himself uh, in Gog before their eyes? Well, how did he sanctify himself in the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, he, he burned them alive. What do you think is going to happen to old Gog, old Edom, when he comes against America? God is going to intervene. America is not going to have to do nothing. And what did God say? I will bring thee against my land. How can God say that? In other words, I will bring you, Gog, against my children Israel. Well, you're reading prophecy of it right now. You're reading that God is prophesying that it will happen right now from this very book. And it shall come to pass. So even though this has been written for thousands upon thousands of years, and the people of Russia now have Bibles and can read this for themselves, they do not understand. That is to say, especially if they're of a darkened heart, which is more fleshly. So yeah, God is going to bring them against his children Israel that he may be sanctified before the eyes of all. Verse 17. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? Uh, yes, quite frankly, that's the truth. God is basically asking old Esau here, in the form of Gog and Magog and Togamora and all the names mentioned, 
Art thou he whom I have spoken of in old time? In other words, back in the Old Testament, as a matter of fact, where you're reading right now, and as well as other places, by my servants the prophets. In other words, I had my prophets prophesy of you. You know, you, you can read Obadiah, you can read Joel, all these allude to uh, old Esau. You, you can even read of uh, Jacob and Esau, and how God hated Esau. Way back in the book of Genesis, and, and other places. All of this has been prophesied aforetime. So God is asking him, Art thou him of whom I have spoken of in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel? Of course the answer is yes. God is saying that rhetorically. Verse 18. And it shall come to pass at the same time, when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. In other words, it's only going to anger God bitterly. Verse 19. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Now, you know, the battle of Armageddon and Haman Gog take place simultaneously. So you could look at this as the literal land of Israel, which we know today. But moreover, we're talking about Israel the people. In other words, the United States of America. Some people even think Russia or uh, Europe, which that, that's not out of the realm of possibility. There are the mountains between uh, certain parts of Russia and Europe. But regardless, moreover, we're talking about Alaska, the Battle of Haman Gog, and we're talking about the Battle of Armageddon, which takes place right before the return of the Lord. Verse 20. So that even the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beast of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Remember what Christ said at the end? Not one stone left standing atop another? That sets the time for when this is going to happen. Verse 21. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. In other words, the two brothers fighting again. Jacob and Esau. Jacob was a shepherd. Esau lived by the sword. But now, Jacob is a warrior. However, God is going to do the warring. Verse 20, And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones of fire and brimstones. Now, what do you suppose this overflowing rain is? Well, what does the dragon bring in the book of Revelation? A great flood. And great hailstones, fire and brimstone, same thing that God rained down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 23. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And why will they know that? Not only because of these events, but because Christ shall be returning at the very same moment these things happen. So, lay that into your mind to meditate upon and think about these things. And, as always, use the tools afforded to us to study your Father's Word. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the J.P. Green's Interlinear, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, the E. Bullinger Companion Bible, and, of course, the good old King James. But first and foremost... Pray to our Father for understanding before you study His Word. Because it is our Father who gives us understanding of these things written all so long ago. And brothers and sisters, always remember to pray for those that walk in darkness because God knows they are the ones that need it the most. So until we see you next time, 
Have a Merry Christmas, everyone, and a Happy New Year. And may God bless you, and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.